I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through, three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. I was going to make a joke, <laughs> but I lost it. I had a joke earlier in the week where I was like, let's, um, let's, let's open with this. And then I also lost it. I guess, so, I guess two empties. I guess, I guess the, the thing is a call to action for everyone out there. So a call has, to action has repulse. Okay. Which is the website you can buy transformers toys from has repulse is currently running a transformers victory saber. Uh, like, campaign for like crowdfunding and like i would really like it if twenty thousand people bought into this campaign because i really want whatever the bonus things that are coming with star saber are um <sighs> because i really really like star saber and i've never gotten a chance to have a star saber toy so like my call to action is just just spend the 190 dollars on this Jeez. for me <laughs> So there's uh-huh. more of a chance that I can get the thing I want. Like that's all. No, no big ask. Just you know, spend one hundred and ninety dollars on this this thing. There's our. So then here's <laughs> my call to action. Gundam just put out their Unleashed series, and I okay. saw a, a build of the uh, RX seventy eight two Gundam Unleashed, mm-hmm. the uh, the the one hundred and sixty model, and um, I want that. So buy and send me. There we go. Wait. Which unleashed? Wait, in our so in RX seventy two, I know, I know, RX seventy two one sixty scale unleashed series because Bandai well, seventy eight dash two. Yeah, what I say seventy two. Oh no, RX seventy eight dash two. Is it the unleashed two point Wait, is it what's the new scale? unleashed series? It's one one sixty scale. I think it's one sixty scale. Okay, it's so a it's really a, good size. It's a perfect grade. It's a perfect grade. It's a perfect so. RX seventy two dash eight perfect grade. Unleashed. Okay, okay, okay. I'm, it looks amazing. They're fantastic. So if it someone's requires got a, a single a one A battery. What is a single A battery? Uh is that a coin cell? That might be a coin cell. I'm not sure, but it requires one. It is pretty oh, gorgeous. It's not a coin cell, it's just a little stubby battery. It's beautiful. I watched a build video Ooh. and it looked amazing. The inner frame's pretty nice. The go inner on. frame is outstanding. Actually, Adam Savage's first Gundam build was that exact piece on camera. What a kit to start with. That's the best thing you could possibly... I have... Like... I've, I don't have any perfect grades, and I want this so hard. It's like $280. Yeah. But it looks worth it. Mm. So your your call to action is you want people to send you something. My yeah. call to action is I want people to spend money on something that they'll get, but Not so I it. can get more. <laughs> Not worth it. <laughs> oh There's, geez. I want I want toy to build, please. Yeah. I don't I don't really even have any like I I've got nothing. It's pumpkin I, so spice dude, season. I had a dude, pumpkin spice latte earlier. That's it. There's nothing. There, there's nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing. The world's over. The world's um, ending. Well, the world's been ending. I saw a great Venn diagram where somehow we ended up in the overlap between apocalypse and I still have to go to work. Yeah, yeah. It's a miracle. It's, um, it's a something. It is something for sure. I, uh... My brain is not working. I I've been I started doing coursework again for my PhD, so like my brain is like completely flooped because I've just been doing constant writing for like the past couple days. So that we've been doing constant writing for the past almost three years. Yeah, but like more and like <laughs> academic writing, right? So like sucks I all don't the cons- fun out of it. The stuff that we do is, I don't consider that academic. Not really. No. No. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, edu, edutainment. We're doing edutainment. 
borderline. Borderline edutainment. Borderline edutainment. Um, all right. Without further ado, though, let's get into this week's cryptid, Brandon. I'm Brandon. I'm John. Also, this is Cryptopedia. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> honestly, honestly, I have never clicked on a show and been like, oh, I hope they explain what the show is. <laughs> like... Like I've never I've never clicked on an on episode 98 of a show and been like, "Man, I sure hope they explain this show to me." Yeah, that's <laughs> I mean, usually I read the 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 summary before I download like, anything. Like I literally have never had that moment where I'm like, "Man, I really hope they wish I really really wish they would explain this because like if they don't, I'm going to be totally in the dark on this one." There, that's kind of why do we why does everyone always assume that people are entering their show fully blind before reading the synopsis or title of the show I mean if you enter the show fully blind you're probably not going to stay on the show no that's really just not what this show is for this show is not for fully blind entering that's all I'm going to say right now um, but anywho uh, so this week's cryptid was first sighted and I'm going to take a hard line in the sand on this one. It was first sighted in 1933. Its taxonomy is plesiosaur, and its region is Scotland. And Brandon, as we've changed the format, you know what this is. It's the Loch Ness Monster. It is, in fact, the Loch Ness Monster. This now, lo- Nessie is, she's a uh, 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 an A-class uh, cryptid we got here. Perfect easily. grade. Perfect grade. I, uh, I, yeah, I mean, she's a something great for sure. Um, Brandon, so you said you could like list off a little bit about the Loch Ness Man- Monster. Give me your facts about the Loch Ness Monster. There's, so it's the famous surgeon's photo. Um, yeah. there was, I believe, and I don't recall any names, but I, I believe they actually found the person who made the little, uh, model that the, the was used in the photo- photograph. Mm-hmm. And um, outside of that, there is a webcam that faces uh, Lake Loch Ness. And uh, people still see Nessie settings just from staring at the webcam on the lake for a while. And that's kind of it. There's been surveys and, and people trying to go out in boats and searching for it. But there's really no substantial evidence um, for Nessie. Yeah, yeah. That's that's pretty accurate. I mean, so I'm not going to try and explain what Nessie is, the phenomena. This is just going to be an episode talking about the origin of Nessie. Like, okay. literally the first three years of Nessie's existence. And it's not the Hazy Maze in Super Mario 64? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, but like, literally, Brandon, this whole episode... So you're going to look down... So people who are listening right now, you're going to look down and you're going to be like, this is over an hour long. Yes, it takes over an hour to explain how Nessie came into existence <laughs> there's we get to uh page eight before we talk about the surgeon's photo so there's yes. a lot there's a lot about nessie somehow okay? we didn't somehow. touch it f- this far because i don't know about you but i assumed and through like cursory google didn't see a whole lot brandon the reason i didn't touch it is because i knew there was this much Oh, opposites. Okay. <laughs> so, so uh, for the Lake Champlain monster episode, um, I did put in the title that it was because Nessie's too hard. We <laughs> did do episode eighty. I how did I forget we did Champ? Yeah. Okay. So, Brandon, and continuing to complete my quest to cover the cryptid, cryptids most podcasts would talk about, like in the first couple of episodes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the things most people probably thought we would have done in the first ten. Yeah, I mean, we started with the we started with red caps in the Enfield mo- horror. So, uh, yeah, like, uh, you know, we we are a thing. Um, so I'm going to delve into Nessie, and it's arguably one of the biggest names in cryptids. This partial plesiosaur has been the focus of many a documentary, movie, and even a Scooby Doo special. Many a documentary. 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 <laughs> Documentary. You know what I fucking meant. Um, <laughs> also, on the subject of Scooby Doo, I saw someone driving around an actual mystery machine. Oh, 
Oh, okay. So when I was in college, there yeah. was someone who had a mystery machine painted van. Mm -hmm. But the best thing about this van is that they only painted the passenger side side of the van. What? And the, dri the driver side was just like burnt sienna brown or whatever. Oh. What? They, they only painted the half that people would see as the mystery machine. They That's only pretty... painted the passenger side. <laughs> That's pretty clever. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. Uh... Anywho, Brandon, most people don't really actually know the real origin of this tale. It's actually rooted in the early 30s and movie magic. Uh, industrial light and magic? They didn't exist in the 30s. Uh, I believe Adam Savage is much older than he seems. Oh, okay, fair. Um, so the main source I'll be using this episode is Abominable Science, Origins of the Yeti, Nessie, and Other Famous Cryptids by Daniel Loxton and Donald Prothero. Okay? So, the Loch Ness, Brandon, is a deep freshwater loch. Um, and it's like a Scottish Gaelic term where it's... Loch is lake, basically. So, there's that. <clears throat> That's um, kind of interesting. All right, so, in... Uh, I was little, so I don't remember where this was. Um, but we have an area with lots of locks here, but I believe in that case, a lock was um, used for a donkey to haul ships along a river. Or am well, I thinking you're, of something? You're talking. You're talking about canal locks. Yes, canal so locks. I'm pretty sure a canal lock is spelled L-O-C-K, but I'm not sure. So a canal lock is different from. Loch it's very and Gaelic. Where very they're, different. It's lake, but with an O. Well, yeah. Well, lock in Gaelic is spelled L O C H. Like lock. But, yeah. Or, or, or phonetically, like so, lock and lake. They're 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 saying oh, okay, lake, okay. but with a Scottish accent is what we're getting at. Basically, basically. All right. But yeah, locks locks, Brandon, are for canals. They're like to make it so you can go up and down hills, sort of. Because gravity. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, that's 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 a different that's that's a whole nother concept, and we're talking in that case about the demon donkey of uh fucking Schenectady, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> there's a there's, there's there's the Erie Canal near there. Uh write a full fake episode about the demon donkey of Schenectady. I don't want to. Okay. <laughs> Um, so Loch Ness is located in the Scottish Highlands. It has a surface area of about 22 square miles, which makes it the second largest Scottish loch by surface area. Now, however, I should note, it's probably the largest, it's almost definitely the largest loch by volume because it's so fucking deep. Um, it's named for the River Ness, which is, I guess Ness stands for Roaring One, um, on its north end. The body of water sits 23 miles southwest of the city of Inverness on the northern half of Scotland, with its surface sitting 52 feet above sea level, which I don't get into in this episode, but that's important. <laughs> um, there are six towns and villages which line the coast of the loch, all of which have uh, the central product in the form of tourism to the loch which, in addition to the natural beauty, is tied deeply, in part, to the Loch Ness monster legend. Now, the region has been inhabited since at least the 6th century AD, as we'll see in the story in a bit, yet the Loch Ness monster, Brandon, doesn't yes. appear in the historical record in its current form until 1933. Okay, all right, so I just did some quick Googling. So if anyone only knows the map of scotland by type of scotch that comes from the regions god damn the, it, the loch ness monster is a highland monster well yeah it's the scottish highlands yeah because it's the highlands that yeah it's the highlands by uh, uh... yeah <laughs> <sighs> okay um so there are some stories that ex exist before 1933, and we're going to cover them in this episode, but they largely appear to be ap apocrypha or just simple misattribution. Um, but before we dissect those pre-1933 histories, 
Uh, it's important to establish the first undisputedly canonical occurrence of the Loch Ness Monster in history. So, Brandon, 1933 wasn't a really great year, I would say. Uh, probably not. Uh, wow, oh, geez, let me... 1933. So, there was probably a lot of things going on. Yeah, there was a lot of things. Uh, the excesses of the Roaring Twenties had given way to a global Great Depression, and a Second World War loomed on the horizon. Against this backdrop, a couple had been driving down a road that ran parallel to the Loch Ness on a spring day in 1933. <laughs> they then saw something that would change how the world viewed Loch Ness. The following is from an article from the Inverness Courier reported by Alex Campbell, Strange Spectacle in on Loch Ness. What was it? And this is the entire, uh, like mo almost the entirety of the article. Loch Ness has for generations been credited with being the home of a fearsome looking monster. But somehow or other, the water kelpie, as this legendary creature is caused, called, has always been regarded as myth, if not a joke. Now, however, comes the news that the beast has been seen one mo once more. For on a Friday of last week, a well-known businessman who lives in Inverness and his wife, a university graduate, when motoring along the north shore of the loch, were startled to see a tremendous upheaval on the loch, which previously had been as calm as the proverbial mill pond. The lady was the first to notice the disturbance, which occurred fully three quarters of a mile from the shore. And it was her sudden cries to stop that drew her husband's attention to the water. There, the creature disported itself, rolling and plunging fully for a minute its body resembling that of a whale, and the water cascading and churning like a simmering cauldron. Soon, however, it disappeared in a boiling mass of foam. So, that's like the first account that exists of the Loch Ness Monster, historically speaking. Um, and in a double rarity for Cryptopedia, Brandon, we know not only who the anonymous couple was... Uh, in the originating story of the Loch Ness Monster, we also know the wife's first name. Th that is significantly uh, uh, uncommon for this type of deal. It really is. I think we've covered this on previous episodes, but finding out the first name of the wife is like... I don't know why, and it probably has something to do with misogyny. But that... it is the most difficult <laughs> thing to find about, like, cryptid sightings. Yeah, oh, it's deep-rooted misogyny, for sure. It's Mr. So-and-so, and then Mrs. Uh, happens to have the same last name. But that's really all you need to know about her. Yeah, yeah. Um, All you need to know is about the name of the penis. <laughs> that is, uh, uh, you know, historically speaking, that is the way it goes, isn't it? Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, so it turns out the couple had been Aldi and John McKay, proprietors of the Drumna Draw Kit Hotel, and were friends of the reporter. While I don't necessarily believe they fabricated the story for the sake of publicity, the story does have two key oddities to it, Brandon. First, the sighting was pretty far away. Three quarters of a mile is a remarkably long distance for any type of reasonable identification, especially in water. Right? And while you're driving. Do we know how close the Drumna Drocket was to uh, Lake Loch Ness? It's, so the Drumna Drocket uh, Hotel, I think, is on Lake Loch Ness, basically. Okay, so it, it, it wouldn't hurt them. It wouldn't to, hurt them, but they also... To put out there that you could stay at our hotel and see the, this monster. True, but they also didn't... So... The only thing I'm going to say is they didn't directly advertise, right? So their name isn't in the original story, you know? Oh, true, 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 yeah. So, like, I'm going to give them credit in that regard. Um, yeah, the, like, the article didn't w didn't say we were looking out our window in the office of the drum to drop it and saw that this yeah. monster was out on the lake. They, there, there wasn't like a shameless yeah. plug. Yeah. So like, I mean, it, there is a chance that it could still be for the sake of, uh, for the sake of getting stuff to go. But like, there's also additional context that I'm going to go over. That makes me think it's less likely. Um, because, uh, there, 
there are some stories from this region, but they have never like resulted in a fervor like the Loch Ness monster. So there's like no reason for them to for us to assume that uh these people were going into this with the intention of like making a Loch Ness monster, right? There were they, there's no no best Netflix doc ever. There's yeah. making a murderer and then making a Loch Ness monster. You pretty much could do a making a monster on this one. Honestly, that would be a pretty good documentary series, making a monster and just going over the histories of like various cryptids oh. and urban legends. I'm gonna edit all this out. TM 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 TM. God damn it! I don't have enough energy to do that. So you know, um, and so you meant you. <laughs> I can't speak. Now, the second most and perhaps most important feature of the story, to me at least, Campbell's story asserts that there were accounts of pre-existing monster stories in the lock, in addition to folk legends of Kelpies, right? So there's there's somewhat of an implication that there's more legends to the lock than Kelpies and other things. Or at the very least, it's it's like he's calling out that it's a fearsome looking monster and not and burying the kelpie notion right yeah um, also a shameless plug uh if you're interested in kelpies cryptopedia podcast episode 31 yep um so like he doesn't explicitly say a uh, historical tradition of the loch ness monster but like the way he words it is kind of mealy yeah you know like because if you led with the fact of like, oh, cryptids, uh, kelpies have been mentioned long in the lake, yada yada yada, blah 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 blah, you know, you kind of couch it in that, and then like, kelpie is a pretty generic myth for Scotland, right? It's not, it's not specific to any one lake. Lakes can have kelpies, but not. There's no like serious lakes known for like. This is Kelpies. the lake that has Kelpies on other lakes don't. Kelpie is like yeah. the generic kind of overarching Scottish monster. It it's like it's like this lake has salmon. Yeah. Right? Or this stream has this this river has salmon in it. Right? It's it's the same kind of notion. It Yeah, but like it doesn't tell like it's there's nothing special about it having salmon because there's like 30 other rivers that have salmon. You know? Yeah. So, but regardless, um, there's a point of contention in the story in that, that in that way. There's not really a meaningful historic record of monsters haunting the Loch Ness, right? Now, the earliest record that is verifiable, I should say, uh, of involving monsters in the Loch can be traced to an 1852 edition of the Inverness Courier. Now, remember, Inverness is a city that's like 23 miles north of Loch Ness, right? It's on the ocean, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, in this story, the public believes that it has seen a pair of sea serpents in the loch. Now, note that they say sea serpents, not kelpies. Okay? Um, very generic term. Notable uh, difference in sea serpents are anatomically different than kelpies. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a frenzy is kicked up as the residents who live near the body of water prepared themselves to challenge, and then the article says either a sea serpent, a whale, a seal, or even a kelp. Okay. So Something they can try to make oil from. Pretty much. You can make oil out of any of those things, to be totally honest, if you try hard enough. Um, that was bearing down on the shore. Now, as the story goes, a man had taken out aim at the creature... When he threw his gun to the ground. Why did he throw his gun to the ground, Brandon? Um, Because that's how guns worked at the time. They were not... They didn't fire missiles. They were more ground talisman. Ground talismans? <laughs> they were ground talismans. That's how you um, unleashed the magic from the gun. I hate it. Um, no, it turns out the the shapes had been a pair of ponies. Who had swum nearly a mile across the lake. So he... It's... He could have shot at the horses 
that were swimming across the lake, and it would have been way more plausible he was firing at a Kelpie. I mean, yeah, because, like, that whole vibe, but they're absolutely ponies. Or like, a puka. He could have said he was trying to kill a... He could have done either one. There's a lot of water horses out in Scotland. God damn it. Well, maybe it, maybe there's not actually a lot of water horses out in Scotland. There's just a bunch of ponies swimming. There's why do their horses like water so much? God, horses kind of like water. It's like a thing. Yeah, but the saying is you, you you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him get out because he likes swimming so much. That's a fact. <laughs> like that is actually so the the make a horse drink it from it. That's actually a uh, bastardization of the original myth. Uh, the original saying, as Brandon has pointed out, that is the crack. In fact, the correct saying. Indeed. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Um, so while this is somehow hilarious, the story is important in telling the tale of the Loch Ness Monster. Nowhere in the Inverness Courier article is a tradition of monstrous inhabitants of the Loch explicitly called out. And keep in mind, this is uh, 80, 52. So this is a this is almost a century before the Inverness Courier article that introduces Lot Nessie to the world, basically. Um, now, if it had been called out, and if there was one that was well known, uh, it wouldn't be using generic terms like kelpie, sea serpent, whale, seal. They'd be using like a more traditional thing. They'd be calling out those legends, right? Wherever there's a local storytelling tradition, it stands to reason that the monster would be called out by the author of the piece. And while it is 23 miles, they're close enough that they're getting these leg- these like urban murmurings. And like, I feel like the people who were there would have been like, oh, it's the fucking Baba Baba again. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, they, they 100% they would have called out. There's a ton of regionally specific um things even if it's a more like general air quote um uh cryptid in scotland in the past articles that we've gone through they'll even say like oh it's the brownie at like mrs bowen's property or whatever so they'll go yeah. to like name specific properties if it's a yeah. generic thing so they're so, they're not really <laughs> doing that in this case and like people do that even when you're talking to them in real life too right like I've definitely heard people say stupid shit like that, explicitly calling out something in my day to day life, right? So, like, and admittedly, the journalists could have just messed up, the, missed this in their story write up, but like, then we cut forward to 1930. There's another story of monsters which finds its way into the Inverness Courier, because apparently the Inverness Courier is the place to be for most Nessie, like, groundbreaking stuff. Now, in this account, three anglers have been fishing for trout in Loch Ness when an unseen shape rushed their boat. In this story, the witnesses were in the water with whatever the creature was, because they're in the boat, uh, and it was a mere 300 yards away from it at the closest. The story, however, makes no allegations of monster stories prior to this, nor than it does, does it ele- necessarily allege that it's a monster in the first place. So, like, they don't explicitly say, oh, uh, a monster came at us. It's more like the reporting is more level-headed and says, like, oh, some unseen creature rushed these people down, right? Yeah, I, I'm a little bit skeptical of this um, just because, like, I've gone fishing. Well, I can stop there. I've gone fishing. I've been done boated and fish. Uh, mm-hmm. My family used to go to Black Lake up near Canada a lot to fish. Um and 300 yards is three football fields. So they're cl- they, they're saying that they were rushed by something three football fields away. Um, and I, even with my glasses on, I, I don't know that I could discern even if anything three, 300 yards away or three football fields away from on a boat in the water. Yeah, but like, so even if this is a bullshit story, the key is that the there's they saw no something additional- weird. There's no additional lore around it, right? Okay. So, like, that's the key. Um, if there were additional, like, bits of story... Because, cause, like, when you're telling... When you're tracking a legend through history, right? Yeah, you've got to get to the th- the things that led into the thing. Yeah, so, like... The pre-Nessies. 
you're gonna have you're gonna have uh bits of pieces that that draw the story together if it's a part of the chain sometimes right yeah. most of the time and like we go from there not being any references to that to in 33 suddenly there's an explosion of stuff right and kind of like so there's another story that predates this uh it appears in um a like telling of like a book about saint columba and now saint columba was an irish monk who lived in the 6th century ad uh who traveled to scotland as a missionary and established a monastery on the island of iona now a century after his death an abbot of the monastery wrote a biography of the saint which honestly is actually pretty vital to like uh as a primary source into the window, like into early Scottish culture. Um, but in addition to like the actually meaningful information, the life of St. Columba recounts the story of a monster encountered by Columba at the river Ness. Now proponents of the, of Nessie, this has become canonically the first occurrence of the creature in the annals of history. Now, as the story goes, Columba had encountered some locals who were engaging in a burial ceremony at the river's edge. So they were burying some dude. Allegedly, the deceased had been killed by a monster while swimming. In what can I can only describe as like religious arrogance, <laughs> Columba requests a member of his entourage to swim across the water to get a boat. The exact water that a man had just been killed in. Is this in line of sight of the burial? Uh, yes. Or, or which may very well likely be a, an actual Viking funeral. <laughs> no, it wouldn't At be a Viking time. funeral. Or Viking style, a... if they're, like, it, on the water. I think it's just, I think they're just burying it, a body by the river. Uh, uh, it's a little bit uncouth, but okay. <laughs> it's not great. You shouldn't Read the do room, that. man. Read the room. You also shouldn't bury a body by the river. It's a bad idea. You're just going to pollute the river. Yeah. Um... So, after entering the water, the following is said to have occurred. But the beast, not so much satiated by what had gone before as wetted for prey, was lurking at the bottom of the river. Feeling the water above it disturbed by the swimming and suddenly coming up to the surface, it rushed with a great roaring and with a wide open mouth at the man swimming in the middle of the stream bed. On seeing this, the blessed man, together with all who were there, the barbarians as much as the brethren being struck with terror, drew the sign of the saving cross in the empty air uh, with his um, upraised holy hand. Having invoked the name of God, he commanded the ferocious beast, saying, Go no further, nor shall you touch the man. Turn back at once. Then indeed, the beast, hearing this command of the holy man, fled terif terrified in a pretty swift retreat, as if it were being hauled back with ropes. Though just before it had approached the swimming monk so closely that it the between the man and beast there had not been more than the length of a small boat pole. So whose Dungeons and Dragons campaign was this ripped from? Uh <laughs> so pretty much it's it's basically it's basically the monastery monk like RPing fucking his his idol, Saint Columba, being like, Oh, he totally did this. That's if anyone's never played D D, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's like there's it's a got... dice roll. There's a dice roll before the monster turns around and leaves. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. other than that <laughs> Oh yeah, no, he got a critical success on his yeah. like like I, I if it was like a <laughs> There was a divine invocation and then he turned if it Absolutely. was a, it could have been a turn undead, who knows? Who knows? Maybe it's a de undead monster. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it really does read like fan fiction. Oh yeah. Right. Because it's like, oh, this dude just did this thing, this magical, magical thing, and here it is. <laughs> yeah. Like we've defined uh, the NPCs and the, yeah. the situation. There's this lake. Yeah. Oh. It, it it's it's kind of fucking hilarious because like. It's a little bold face in like how kind of hero worshipy it feels. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? This is this is 
This reads like a high fantasy novel written during the time that most high fantasy novels might take place. Yes, basically. Pretty much. Um, so the monster in this tale is really only superficially related to the Loch Ness Monster in that it is has proximity to the Loch being in the River Ness and the fact that it operates aquatically. Now, moreover, this is an account crafted by a man who had never even met Columba himself. Magic and divinity abound in the tales of St. Columba, and many really don't differ from contemporary tales of feats performed by saints. Now, because, of course, the dominance over, of Christianity over nature is, like, a very, very, very recurring theme. And I, I said in the story tra- telling traditions of the era, but really it's still a thing, right? Like, this whole notion of dominance over the world because of Christianity. It's, it's very deeply it's, enmeshed in it's, the religion. It's, it's in the Bible is is yeah. their their divine being using nature and conquering nature. Yeah, to, it's to it's invoke a, retrib- retrib- retribution. <laughs> like that's, it's, it's 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 kind of enmeshed. Yeah, that's that's it, their thing. It's a little enmeshed in, in Christian Christianity and Christian Christian storytelling as a result. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Um That being said. The dubious nature of this tale, Brandon, has not stopped Nessie believers from claiming it as the first historical record of the creature. In okay. a book written a century after the event happened. Perfect. By someone who had nothing to do with it. Or any secondary <laughs> sources that I can know Any of. books written a century after anything are written by someone who had nothing to do with that event. Well... Not if Jack Harkness is involved. Not if Jack Harkness is involved. That's oh, I'm st- I'm almost done with the latest season of uh, Doctor Who, and Jack Harkness does make an appearance. Yeah, I got to that episode. Ah, oh, it's pretty I, cool. I missed and forgot about him. I forgot about him too, but it was kind of wild to see him again. Um, so instances of the monsters in Loch Ness lore aside, the publication of Strange Spectacle on the Loch Ness. On Loch Ness, what was it? Really primed the pump for future stories, Brandon. On August 4th, 1933, a letter from Londoner George Spicer was published in the Inverness Courier. Apparently, Spicer had seen something mysterious while driving along the shore in broad daylight. I saw the nearest approach to a dragon or prehistoric animal that I had ever seen in my life. It crossed the road about 50 yards ahead and appeared to be carrying a small lamb or animal of some kind. It seemed to have a long neck, which moved up and down, in the manner of a sea link railway. And the body was fairly big, with a high back. So, so that's a really interesting article, and you, you may, may very well mention it. Uh, um, I, I didn't read ahead. So, dragons, not surprising in the Scottish area to be referenced in, in an article. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Maybe in 1933, rather than like 1833, but, yeah. but not uncommon. The interesting thing and the thing that stood out to me is this is the first time prehistoric animal came about in a news article. Yeah. Well, we're going to we're going to touch on that a lot later. Like a lot later. Like a lot lot later. It's going to okay. be a big it's going to be a big thing is what I'm going to say. That was um, the standout line in that that article. That is very very good catch cuz it absolutely is the standout line in that article. Okay. Um <laughs> So Spicer then saw the beast cross the road with a very long neck moving rapidly up and down um, in curves. The creature then had the gray skin of a rhinoceros or elephant and was able to block the whole road with its length, estimated by Spicer to be 25 to 30 feet. And as mentioned in the, the article, it was gruesomely, it had a small animal in its mouth. Now, with this account, Spicer had redefined the monster, giving it a long neck, gray skin, and an approximate size. Conspicuously, the creature's legs were not described in the letter, however. Can I ask a question? Go is, for it. Is this going to turn into an Angry John episode? Because no, actually. Actually, this not, turns into be, a Happy John episode. We, we have the two ingredients that... that, that, that oh. That's, we, have, we, have, we have modern dinosaurs and Christianity, which aren't infrequently involved with young earth creationism and that has a that there's a a recipe in that so brandon 
we aren't going to get into that in this episode because I deliberately didn't go past the origin story of Nessie in this. <laughs> so there is, there might in, be, there there may, it would be unsurprising to see Nessie tied to young earth creationism uh, with just this information here. Yeah, there might be, but like, here's the thing, Brandon. Um, I decided early on that I was just going to be doing the origin story of this. I wasn't going to get into any of like the subsequent scans of the the lock or any of the billion societies that exist to search for the Loch Ness monster or the modern tourist industry or anything like that. I, okay. I'm just I'm just doing the origin. This is not going to be a Mad it, John episode. Okay, so I'll. I'll... We'll, we'll, we'll we'll dog ear that page. There might be a. There's going to uh, be. A, a, a part two where we learn that the people paying for the scans of the river are being funded by young earth creation if they groups. aren't if they aren't i'll be amazed uh the same people funding like the mop and guarai expeditions and stuff like that <laughs> uh, i just so like <sighs> so the, the next episode's not gonna be a loch ness not loch ness episode mo- like monster episode guys because like Right now, I just can't handle a, a Mad John <laughs> There's too much. You have too much scholarly work. I have too much shit that needs to be done. And getting mad over the Loch Ness Monster is not in my wheelhouse of things I want to do. No, right we don't need any papers being submitted that just end with, like, all caps screaming about uh, things. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just need to take a little bit. I, I need a, I need a bri- I need to work on my actual academics. <laughs> And, yeah. like, throwing me getting angry about people using the Loch Ness Monster for young Earth creationism is not going to be a good thing for me. Yeah, we could use geolocation around these uh, areas that tend to be hotspots for uh, YEC uh, monsters. If you'd like, we could make a new app. You want to make a new app? Let's do no. that. No, I don't. I want it to, I want it to not exist. I don't want to even <laughs> acknowledge their existence right now. So... George Spicer's description description was actually fairly similar to a sauropod, which continues in the tradition of Cryptopedia favorite Mokile Membe. Now, the public at this point becomes enamored with the Loch Ness monster. A cycle of press hype, press hype and public reports began at this point as the monster reached soaring levels of popularity. Only a half a year after the first sighting, a film was produced. What? Only a year after the first sighting, a film was produced. It was called The Secret of the Lock, Brandon. It there's, was a fiction. There's, I'm sorry, before you can continue, I, I have to let people know that if if you're reading along and yet there you can read our, our, our scripts, copies, or what have you, and there's pictures and news article clippings in there if you're interested, you just ignored the fact that someone illustrated a 25-foot-long black sperm crossing a road. You just glossed past that. So, uh, this is, this is something that, so this was drawn by Rupert Gold and then, uh, one of the authors of the book redrew it, but yeah, it is basically, it is basically a sperm. It's it is a massive sperm. sperm. It is basically a massive sperm. I can't, I can't deny that fact. I, I that's, can't. That, that's, that's it. There's, it's undeniable. It's just a giant wiggly woo. It's a giant sperm with like a growth. There's or like a, you know what the, it's got, if you've ever seen like an old bald guy, it's a giant sperm that's got that one back of the head wrinkle. Mm, or like a skin tag. Or a skin tag. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe it's like a, a penis. It's a sperm with a penis. Okay. Okay. Well, getting back to it. <laughs> Uh, only a year, it, though The Secret of the Lock was only released a year after the first sighting, Brandon. It was released in 1934 of May, so like literally a year after it. They cranked out movies a lot faster back then. They really did. They really did. It was 78 minutes, though. Not bad. Yeah. Not bad. Um, I don't... I don't know if uh, there's like... I don't know if there's like a a video of the secret of the lock. I don't know if it's one of those things that's just like a missing piece of media now or whatever. Oh wait, no, no, it's it looks like um there is 
in fact, a, like, monster, maybe, that was in the film? Uh, maybe it would... Oh, it's... Su okay, surprisingly enough, oh, there's it's uh, a... it's a fucking... It looks like it's a fucking iguana, Brandon. Oh, good. Oh, wait. Oh, there it is. It is an iguana. They use a fucking iguana. It is. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, in this fictional film, the lead character ultimately asserts that the creature is a diplodocus, which, if you don't remember, is this type of sauropod. Now, Nessie's explosion to fame largely follows the same arc as Chupacabra. Although, due to the scale of the creature, it appears to have been more location-bound than its later successor. Now, regardless, people began to look for the creature, and the media was far too happy to oblige. Like, crazy happy to oblige. Um, and, of course, there's a fucking... So, I guess, I guess the dude, like, encounters the iguana in the film? Um... It was also... Okay, 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 okay. Okay. So there's a German movie called um, uh, The Secret of Loch Ness, or in German, I think it, it looks like it's called The Wonder of Loch Ness. Um, and it doesn't have anything to... It does not appear to what? have Nessie in it. It looks like it has, like, an E.T. I, it's a druid, I think? Like a, a centauri druid, guardian of the philosopher's, philosopher's stone and Arthur's treasure. There's an E.T. druid that hides King Arthur, or protects King Arthur's treasure at Loch Ness. Oh. Das Wunder, or, or, yeah, Das, das Wunder von Loch Ness. <laughs> I just, oh, sorry also, to derail you, but that, that, uh, that was a jarring image. It kind of looks like Mac and Me. Yeah, a it's bit. a very Mac and Me. It looks like uh, the alien from Mac and Me, and this came out after it, so I'm assuming that they just copied the Mac and Me alien. It looks like a Miyagi and Me movie. It's 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 if Mac from Mac and Me and Mi Mr. Miyagi had a child. <laughs> if they had a child and he taught German Harry Potter how to use magic. Pretty much, pretty much, pretty much. Um, It's also funny, so going back to the secret of the lock, uh... This is what TV Guide said about it. A trite program which doesn't make one believe in the human's actions, much less the sea serpents. Oh, glowing review, I see. Terrible, but amusing. I mean, that's fair. I like, th I'm not opposed. Listen, MST3K I made a whole industry about that. Well, I mean, the, the, the key part of this that makes it like, hilarious is the fact that they used an iguana for Loch Ness. Yeah, because this is also the, the, the same era where you'd get like claymation dinosaurs and people fighting those. Yeah, well, and like... that would have been much cooler. We're gonna get into that in a second. Don't worry. Oh, good. Um, so while much of the public, Brandon, was in a frenzy over a possible monster inhabiting lake, not everyone was sold on the notion of a creature. As noted before in this episode, there exists no record of the creature in the region, and people in the region were very happy to point that out to people. Oh, good. So, in response to the Inverus Courier asserting a generational history of monster sightings, a steamship captain from the area had the following to say: "It is news to me to learn of your correspondent state, uh, learn as your correspondent states that for generations the lock has been credited with the home of a fearsome monster." <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Uh, a steamship captain who travels up and down the lock is like, that's news. That's a new one. That's also, that's the job most attributed to seeing, like, sea monsters. <laughs> exactly. That's, he's like, huh, that's new. That's a, that's a new one. All right. Uh, now, undeterred, however, newspapers routinely publish letters from individuals alleging a history of monster sightings in this region. Um... Through this act of unethical reporting, yet another record of the creature was added to the canon. In 1895, by the Duke of Portland. Now, this story has really no substance but beyond this unsubstantiated claim that the Duke had heard of a great, a horrible great beast in the Loch Ness region around 1895. That's it. He heard, he, he heard a thing. Yeah. He heard. So this is he a, heard. No, he didn't even hear the thing, Brandon. 
He heard from someone else about a horrible beast. Yeah, so the the article the article itself is a third hand account. Yes. Yes. Ugh. So cool. articles backdated to support the monster also appeared, yet none stand up to scrutiny nor have the evidence to support the claims. Now, I called out the the three before the the three articles, the three stories before because one is regarded as the first sighting of Nessie. Uh, one establish it, the other two establish that there's really not a tradition of monsters that exists, right? Um, but there's more that have been backdated. I don't really go over it whatsoever. So now, Brandon, you'll remember, or you probably as soon as you hear the word Loch Ness monster, and probably most of our listeners, this, as soon as they hear the word Loch Ness monster, will remember that Nessie is usually depicted as a plesiosaur, right? Yep, most uh, indeed. So, yeah, so a plesiosaur is basically a sauropod that, like, it looks like a, it's got the long neck, it's got the round body, it's got the flappers, the flippers, and it moves through the water, right? Um, and now, the notion that Nessie was a plesiosaur almost immediately entered the public consciousness after the Spicer sighting. Uh, Alex Campbell, who had reported on the first sighting of Nessie, was an ardent supporter of the plesiosaur hypothesis. So much so that Campbell even began to uh, rewrite not only regional history, but his own history. Oh, good. Suddenly, not only was it true that Loch Ness had for generations been credited uh, with being the home of a fearsome monster, but Campbell himself had seen the infamous plesiosaur. Campbell, brazenly described as having seen a creature raise its head and body from the lock, pause, move its head, a small head on a long neck, rapidly from side to side, apparently listening. While it was above the water, he could see the swirl made by each movement of the limbs, and the creature seemed to be fully 30 feet in length. Okay, so he's actually describing the hazy maze monster at this point, then. Pretty much. Well, I mean, the hazy maze monster is a plesiosaur. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> um, I want to also point out, when he wrote the first story, he didn't, like, allege that this was the Loch Ness Monster that he had seen in the report. He, had, he wasn't like, this reporter has also seen blah, 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 blah. But what he did do is he told this story, along with his neighbor, to reporter Philip Stalker in October of eight, 1933. Hilariously, Brandon, almost immediately after the story went public, Campbell rolled back his testimony, instead claiming he saw a group of water birds in the in this instance. Oh, okay. So he, he just then, caved. He just caved immediately. So yeah, sort of. Except for the fact that he then went on to claim eighteen additional sightings of the Loch Ness monster after this retraction. It's a, he retracted his retraction. Retra- I honestly, Brandon, feel as though he did this because he wanted to fuck over Philip Stalker in some way, right? Like, I feel like he told him a story and then immediately retracted it to be like, see, this fucker didn't even do his research. Oh, good. Just some vitriol really helps. I can't prove that, though, right? But, like, there's a part of me that, like, wouldn't be surprised if someone went through the records and found out that Philip Stalker and Alex Campbell had just, like, a fight. Just a feud going on. Yeah, and, like, this was just another step in the the feud. Or, if the feud started after this, I wouldn't be surprised at that either. Now, Brandon, it's very important to remember that at this part of the story, it is the 1930s still. A global depression is happening during this era, and frankly, Nessie is a revenue stream. So obvious was that that it was a revenue stream that the Scottish Travel Association needed to issue a denial that the they engineered the monster for tourism dollars. Stephen oh. Goble, Goebbels of the Nazi Party, yeah. you know the propaganda, the main prop, the lead propagandist of the Nazi Party, yeah, even was like they fucking made that up for money. <laughs> Oh wow! Now, I be- I actually kind of 
side with the Scottish Travel Association in this regard. Um, because really, the the way that Nessie progresses is really no different than a lot of other Cryptopedia alumnus. And making it a conspiracy carried out by governmental for- forces is kind of a violation of Occam's Razor. Um, especially when you consider that Chupacabra kind of follows the same exact like progression for how it became popular a little bit. Yeah, like there's there are uh, more than a handful, plenty of examples of like local monsters being used by their local government to make money. Um, but when that's happening, it's obvious that that's happening and you can see like all these advertisements being put out there by that local government. They're, yeah. they, they're not saying it's not us. We didn't do it. And then like trying to like push that away. They're embracing in, 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 in that. Yeah. Um, so I, I tend to side with the, uh, the, <sighs> their, the government in that case too, that it's, it wasn't them likely. I, I don't think, so here's the thing, like if you're making up a cryptid, Right, I feel like if the government, like local government, is making it up, I don't think that there's enough competent people to do that. If like, the local government's making it up, there's usually a poorly made statue of it somewhere to yeah. break in the revenue. Like, like the problem I have with that, and, and it's not that I don't think that people in local government aren't competent. It's that I don't think that they're advertising competent. Because I've been to a lot of local government things. I've seen a lot of local government posters. Their <laughs> advertising game is frequently not on point, is all I'm going to say. True. And, like, there's a level of sophistication in creating a cryptid. A believable cryptid that is... Well, when I say believable, believable enough to people who believe in cryptids. Right. But like still there is a little bit of a barrier for entry to make that possible. Um like any anyway. like believable enough to convince people from outside to travel to a place. Yeah. Is that's, outside the realm of I feel that. like that's out outside the realm of like reasonable, like and not only that, but like for it to stay a secret that they did that. Yeah. Right. During like, a depression. That's, that's the hardest thing. That's that's the yeah. most difficult part. Um, regardless, once the monster was in the lock, there was profit to be made in exploiting the legend. Travel companies entered the fray, promoting so many train and bus tours, Brandon, that special bus rules needed to be introduced in 1934 to deal with the sheer number of buses lining the lock. Oh, good. Yeah. Nessie spread to radio, comics, movies, and even advertising. In 1934, Nessie was Scotland's chief intangible export, and people couldn't get enough of it. Now, amid all this financial fervor, photographs of the Loch Ness Monster began to crap up, with the earliest appearing in November of 1933. Brandon, we haven't left 1933, I want to point out. Yeah, time is traveling slowly in this one. Yeah, usually we're out of the first year by now. If, yeah. if it's a multi, if it's like one of these types of cryptids, we're usually out of the first year by now. No, a lot of shit happened really quick, close together. Um, so Hugh Gray had spotted the monster when walking home from church. He took a series of five photographs, with only one having of anything of any note. And now, Brandon, it's on the next page. Can you describe that picture to me? Yeah. So it is. Um, I'll say a very clear shot black and white of water and then in the middle of that water there's a wiggle a squiggle there's a squiggle in the middle of the water Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um with um i don't know how to describe that rays ray tracing it looks like there's a worm that got shot out of the sky by god into a lake (laughs) fair fair I don't know how else uh, to describe those wispies coming yeah, off. Yeah, that's that's fair. It's it's like mist almost or fog. It's mist, um, but it's mist with a velocity. Yeah. So really though, the photo is basically useless. Right? Yeah, you, like, there's you can't tell that it's anything. The, the the information in it is extremely extremely limited. So it's yeah. there's water, but there's nothing to reference 
it's only water so you have no reference for scale or location and then dead center is a thing of unknown scale and you can't really tell what it is you can't even tell what the shape of it is so for my armchair it kind of looks like a wave that's just a little bit blurry or like has a little bit of water coming off of it but to the author of abominable science it's a golden retriever swimming and quite frankly it kind of looks like a golden retriever swimming if you look at it. Like, there's two ways to look at it and see the golden retriever. One oh. is that the, it's swimming towards you, and one that it's swimming away from you. I would say, the if I was to say it's a golden retriever, the left side would be a tail, and the right side, it would be a little bit fatter, and there would be a head on the far right near where that it, it kind of, stuff so is. It, it kind of looks like a, a dog swimming. Because, like, also you could kind of see ripples coming off of it uh, to the left side. But, like, Brandon, this is, like, this it's, is spec... There's it's not so enough hard. information to there's discern really clearly what There's really not enough information. Yeah. Um, if I had to guess a direction of travel based on the ripples of water, it's moving from left to right. But yeah. that itself is pure speculation. Yep, yep. It's completely worthless. Uh, but, Brandon... This is incredibly key in the lore of Nessie. One prominent Nessie expert, Rupert Gold, had the following to say, Although indefinite, it is both interesting and undoubtedly genuine. It... Although indefinite is both interesting and undoubtedly genuine. So he's saying it's a real picture, but we don't know what it is. Pretty much. I wouldn't call it interesting either, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's... Like, people like also... Get, get good. When, you, when you're a bullshit artist, you get good at phrasing bullshit in a way where people will go, Ah, I see. But you have to go like, no. No, you don't see. Because he, I in his see. own quote, said it's both indefinite, meaning you can't tell what it is. And it's undoubtedly, he's saying it's a real picture of some bullshit. That's what he's saying. <laughs> yeah, no, that's literally what he's saying. It's completely, it's complete garbage, right? Um, and I don't really get into Rupert Gold in this episode because he comes a little later in the story. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's complete bullshit. <laughs> and Brandon, it gets better. Gray had a, claimed to have already seen the Loch Ness Monster. And he saw it six times total, right? So the, this picture is from the second time he saw it, and he's seen it six times over the course of his life. Now, Brandon, there are millions of people who have visited the lock to see it and have not seen it, as well as thousands who work and live in the region who claim not to see it. That's an extremely it, high incidence rate, and I would say that's a very high rate given that the sightings and air quotes have really only happened over the course of a year. So he's seen it six times in one year. No, not in one year, just over his life. But but still, he's seen it twice already this year. Yeah. Right? So that alone is, is a bit of a red flag. His luck is a bit too good. And actually, Brandon, this is kind of a common trend in Loch Ness Monster sightings. Because remember, uh, Campbell up there had already, had, had over his life, claimed to see it 18 times. Yeah. So like, he's these guys are really lucky. I, it's it's one of those things where people either see it a bunch of times or never see it. Which, um... I mean, that's kind of a trend, I guess, almost, in, in, yeah. in this specific, like, crypto paranormal things. Like, people mm -hmm. either see ghosts all the time or never. Or never. People mm -hmm. see Bigfoot frequently in the woods or never. Which which speaks a little bit to the nature of human perception and wanting to see stuff, as well yeah. as potentially just literal fraud. Uh, because Brandon, guess what? Oh yeah, what's that? <laughs> there have been several people who have been explicitly for exposed as frauds, such as Frank Cyril, who allegedly firebombed the Loch Ness and Morar Project expedition in 1976 when tensions reached a fever pitch, and he was exposed as a fraud. So. And what do we mean by firebomb? I, I think if my memory is correct and I, my reading was correct, uh, they firebombed like the office of the oh, ex expedition. That wasn't like um, no, th no, that wasn't was a, a very literal. That was a literal. literal. 
literal, literal. Uh, he's alleged to have firebombed it. There was no proof, but he might have. There's, um so this could say as in the case of alleged arsonist frank Cyril, is how we could have started that yeah pretty much oh geez okay uh, uh and this is after he was exposed as a fraud too so you know oh uh, uh so tensions run high in lot in nessie photos and that was a little bit of a jump to the future but like it's just too good of a like thing to not mention now Gray wasn't the only person to take a photo in the 1930s. In fact, the photo you probably associate with the Loch Ness Monster was taken on April 21st, 1934, by a, gyne- uh, China, by a gynecologist by the name of Robert Kenneth Wilson. So, Brandon, it was originally published in the Bastion of Truth that is the Daily Mail. Oh, the fantastic. Surgeon's, the surgeon's photo is the iconic image of the Loch Ness Monster. Like, if you think, I guarantee that if you think of the Loch Ness Monster right now, this is the thing that pops into your head. Like, I literally, if you don't think of this when you think of the Loch Ness Monster, I will be amazed. There's, so, and I see that in, like, one line you talk about this, but when you think of images of cryptids in media, there are only two that come into my head right away, and those mm-hmm. two are the surgeon photo and the Patterson Gimlin uh, mm-hmm, film. Mm-hmm. It, like, it's, those it's, are the most iconic. Yeah, it, in it's media. those. Those are the kind of things that people. Those are the kind of things that people who are not interested in cryptids know about. Yeah. Right. Like that's how iconic this photo is. And now, just by if by some miracle you haven't seen it, uh, it was taken in black and white. It has a plesiosaur-shaped shadow, which occupies the center of the frame, with a creature appearing to look off to the right side of the photo. Its head is completely above the water. Um, and there's, like, ripples around it, and that's basically it. Um, now, for years, this photo was absolutely a smoking gun for believers of the Nessie story. Roy Mackel, a University of so- Chicago cryptozoologist, even wrote the following in 1976. Every student of the Loch Ness Phenomena has accepted this picture as depicting the head neck of a large animal in Loch Ness. Now, on the other hand, less credulous investigators had explanations ranging from the dorsal fin of a diving... uh, The dorsal fin uh, of a diving otter. I think I wrote that wrong. uh, Or a waterfowl. The story behind the photo, however, is incredibly mundane, as you may have... You may already be aware. With the photographer uh, claiming that he saw the creature and quickly grabbed his camera to take a photo before it disappeared. Now, I could attack the authenticity of the photo, noting that the photo is massively cropped, Brandon, and that the waves indicate a figure far smaller than the reputed 30-foot-long monster, but there's really no value in expending this intellectual energy. And on the next page, if you're reading uh, along, uh, there's the original picture. And most people haven't seen the original picture. That, I was waiting to comment on this. So, so yeah. Looking at this copy that you've written, one, I've never seen the uncropped photo. So, mm-hmm. looking at, I was sliding back and forth between the, I'll call it the dog in water picture above and this photo below that is the cropped version. And you can tell there's an incredible difference in scale evident by the size of the water ripples mm-hmm, around mm-hmm. it. And that, that one, the, the surgeon photo um, that I'm used to seeing is incredibly small compared to the smaller ripples in the water, right there. Mm-hmm. The, the, the water ripples are large compared to the object um, in this cropped photo. That's incredibly more evident or uncropped photo. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> an exceptionally small um, thing for for uh, uh, oh yeah not being good at words. <laughs> yeah, it's, no, <laughs> it's it's not that big, and there's a lot more context around it to show how not big it is. Mm-hmm. It, it's it, it's very very clearly not large, right? Like if you see the uncropped photo of this picture like, uncropped version of this picture, it is, like, painfully obvious that this is, like, a toy size thing, right? Yeah. Like, 
it, it it's ridiculously obvious. But Brandon, I'm not going to spend any more time debunking it because in 1975, the Sunday Telegraph printed a short article in which Ian Weatherill, the then 63 year old son of Marmaduke well- Reveler, Weather Marmaduke Weatherell revealed that the photo was in fact a hoax. Marmaduke Weatherell, who I actually didn't cover, who had done another hoax in the like Loch Ness story in like 33, but like I thought it wasn't really all that interesting to talk about. Um, he had used an ashtray mounted in a hippopotamus foot to fabricate Nessie ho- footprints, which is was a hoax exposed in his lifetime. So basically what he did was he went on a hunt for Nessie and found footprints and then someone took a casting of it. They sent it to London and they were like, oh, this is very clearly a hippopotamus foot. Okay. And not only that, but it was, there's an actual, like the ashtray foot for the hippopotamus foot still exists. To oh, this perfect. Day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so alongside his father, Ian had built a model monster around a toy submarine inside, like like around a, like a toy or submarine. So it's like yeah. really small, right? They drove up to Scotland, and at the lock, they found an inlet where the ripples appeared to be full size waves. They put the sub in the lock and then took a handful of pictures. Now, Brandon, you might be surprised to know that this story was not widespread at the time it was like published. And in fact, it wasn't until 1990 when Adrian Shine rediscovered it long after the death of both Ian and Marmaduke. Uh, so, like, it doesn't enter the public consciousness until 1990 because someone was doing research on, like, newspaper articles about Loch Ness. Yeah, it, it, that's, I, I'm not surprised it was never popular because outside of um, that article... A lot of the articles that debunk um, these things tend to be less popular than the thing itself because it's way cooler and more popular to discover like, oh, the world I live in could possibly have some of this magic and unknown mystery to it. Mm -hmm. And it's it's less popular to be like, oh, there's everything's uh, you're not special and the world's not special, I guess. Yeah. No, I mean, and that's a relatable feeling, you know. Like I, I recognize that, you know. It, it's, it's reasonable. It, it, it's sad sometimes when you realize that certain things don't exist. But like at the same time, the world is filled with enough stuff that like I fe- always feel like that's such a crappy argument. You know what I mean? Like yeah, fucking, fucking the those those fish that see in colors we can't, those shrimp that see in colors we can't see, the jet punch fish. Like those exist, yeah. The it was right? not the peacock. Is it the peacock shrimp? The rainbow pistol shrimp. Uh, the, the, pistol the rainbow shrimp. rainbow it. pistol shrimp. They yeah, can see shrimp. in colors we can't see, and they can punch underwater faster than like they create a vortex that can shatter glass. Yeah. So like those exist in the world. We don't need a Loch Ness monster because those insane creatures exist, right? And like I'm jealous of their ability to see other colors, but that's a whole other. There thing. are w- there are superpower rainbow demons in the water that we also eat during Super Bowl parties. That's the world we live in. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we eat their relatives. We eat their relatives. Yeah. The we're not going to eat. We're probably not eating pistol shrimp. No. No. Uh, but Brandon, despite the fact that Ian and Marmaduke were dead, there was a relative, Sperling Weatherwall who was still alive, and he claimed to have built the model with Ian. <laughs> oh, good. So, Brandon, you might be asking yourself at this point, wait a minute, Marmaduke wasn't the name of the person who allegedly took the photo. You'd be right yeah. to question this point. Because it appears that the film had been passed between the Weatherells to Maurice Chambers, and finally to Wilson, who is the surgeon, in, the titular surgeon, who would then submit to the painting. The paper. Interestingly, Wilson, the surgeon, had been cagey about the photo, insisting he never claimed the photo depicts the so-called monster. In fact, I am unconvinced and intend to remain so. Which is questionable when the person who took the photo is like, I don't think it's a... I'm not going to say whether or not it's a monster. 
that's always questionable. Yeah. Uh, moreover, Brandon, there's external evidence in the form of an account by Major Eginton, who had served under Wilson in the Army in 1970. In his account, Wilson had even told him that he faked it with Chambers. Furthermore, Wilson and Chambers would frequently hunt together near Inverness, as noted by Wilson's relatives. Well, this is largely secondhand accounts. There are enough of sources that point to this postulate point to this that this postulation that Wilson and Chambers and uh, Weatherall were like all a part of like this little little group. Yeah, like, and it's it's not a- surprising that like someone would make a thing to, to to be a hoax of this and then pass it on to your buddy to create a couple degrees of separation. And well, then- also Mar- Marmaduke was already caught hoaxing. Right. Yeah. So, like, he wouldn't be able to just say that it existed because he was already caught for for hoaxing. Yeah. You know. But yeah, it's more plausible that he just gave it to his hunting buddy. Yeah. Yep. Um. Now, Brandon, there are accounts past the surgeon photo. There's counselor, countless sol- sonar expeditions that have been carried out to find the creatures. Um. And like, there's been there's the camera that you talk about. There's there's just been a shitload of shit done looking for the Loch Ness monster. There's also movies and videos of supposedly Loch Ness monster. But like, I'm gonna end the episode here uh, and cover those exp- those explorations in future episodes because I have the feeling they have their own like nonsense around them. That's a whole fucking thing. There's, we could probably do an entire episode based off, like, Animal Planet, Discovery Channel, and History Channel episodes where they we do could. sonar expeditions of we, the Loch Ness and never find anything. We literally could. We literally could. Um, To me, though, Brandon, these stories have a very different impact than the ones I talk about today. Today's accounts are the genesis of the cryptid and the formation of the creature that pops into our head even now. Now, I don't believe that the Loch Ness Monster exists in the biological sense. However, it does exist in the hearts and minds of society, like the people of society. Um, And really, at the point of the surgeon photo, there's not a whole lot of changes to to Nessie's biology after that. We still pretty much, like, the stereotypical Nessie is very deeply rooted in that surgeon's photo, right? Um, Now, I have a question, though, because of all this. Why okay. did Nessie get so popular? Right? Because, like, we've got Champ, we've got Ogopogo, we got Mokila Membe, there's even the, the Hudson River monster that exists, whose name I can't remember off the top of my head. Kipsy? Um, Kipsy. So, like, we have all of these lake monsters, sea monsters, all of this shit, but none of them are, like, on the level of Nessie, right? Like, no. you're not going to go up to somebody and say, hey, you ever hear of uh, Ogopogo? And they're going to instantly be like, oh, yeah, I've totally heard of Ogopogo. You might catch some people, but you're never going to be, you're never going to have the same, like, rate of being like, it's like Nessie. And then somebody instantly knows what you're talking about, right? Like, people who have no interest in cryptids and cryptozoology love Nessie. Oh, There's yeah. There's something, like, iconic about her. Yet, the bones of her story are really not that different from nearly a hundred other cryptids we've covered on this show, Brandon. Yeah, true. Like, literally, her backstory is not that different than a lot of cryptids we talk about, right? Like, almost all of the modern cryptids we talk about follow this exact progression in terms of how they develop. Chupacabra especially. So... For an explanation of this phenomenon, I'm going to defer to abominable sciences theory. Because I actually think it's pretty... I think it's actually the best possible explanation. Now, 1933 wasn't just Nessie's debut. There was another monster who broke onto the world stage with staggering success. While Nessie swam the depths, her contemporary dominated the silver screen. Brandon... King Kong premiered in New York City on March 2nd, 1933 to rave reviews in, like, astounding commercial success, grossing over $5 million in 1933 in the middle of the Great Depression. Yeah. Now, while 
it doesn't really compare to modern special effects, Brandon. King Kong was a pioneer in the field and employed a variety of techniques ranging from stop motion in in miniatures to matte painting and rear protection of... The film was like a visual effects triumph, right? It was at the, like, bleeding edge of technology. The public loved the film, and it absolutely captured their imagination. Now, Brandon... You might remember something about King Kong. I don't. I personally have never watched the entirety of King Kong, um, like the original one. But I've watched a lot of bits and pieces. I've watched all the bits that matter, and by that, the bits that have King Kong. Everyone's in them. seen like the the fight scenes and the um, yeah. like climbing the tower and, and that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So during the Skull Island portion of the film, and for those who are not familiar with the original 1933 film, uh, Kong fights a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and more importantly. A Diplodocus attacks the humans. In the scene in question, the Diplodocus rises from the water and fog to attack the Avengers, ultimately eating one of the unlucky souls. Now, to 1933 audiences, this scene would have been striking and frankly unlike anything they've ever seen before. If, for instance, someone had been to a London showing of the film, which had opened on April 10th, 1933, uh their mind might have been primed to see the creature. The McKays could have conceivably seen the film in the days preceding their co- their sighting, uh, coloring their perceptions. Moreover, in Spicer's case, the description of the creature's movement across the field is nearly identical to the diplodocus scene in the film. Like, literally identical, the description. Because the, the, the diplodocus actually moves left to right across the screen and eats a human in the film. Yeah. I, I looked right. up some pictures of that scene from the movie, and the uh, Diplodocus is the the surgeon photo looks like a silhouette, a side face silhouette of what the Diplodocus is in yes. that that movie. Yes, literally, like, like literally. jarringly close. Um, if you go in that video that you posted the picture from, if you go to minute two o one, I think. Wait, uh, no, two thirteen in that. Uh, it's, that's, that's the scene in question that people are calling out. Um, so in the scene, the Diplodocus climbs up a hill. There's a man stuck in a tree. Um, and, uh, like it cuts between the man in a stop motion form. And then the Diplodocus just bites the man out of the tree. Yeah. Right. And like, it's almost identical in nature to the descriptions that have been given about it. Like even the head moving back and forth on the different Yeah. Things, right. So like, like Brandon, a lot of the stuff we talked about in this episode resembles that like two minute scene. That, yeah. As, like a prototype. Like you could take that scene as a prototypical Nessie effectively. And, like, Brandon, you couple all of this with the fact that the public is absolutely in love with this film, right? And, like, frankly, this is one of the first blockbuster films, right? Like, it is a phenomenon. You have the perfect recipe for a cultural icon such as Nessie to take hold because people are primed for it. People are ready for Nessie because of this. They have something to latch onto, right? And then people give them Nessie. These, these, this, this, the Nessie just emerges from this. And if it hadn't happened in Loch Ness, it would have happened somewhere else, because it was just like the time for Nessie to be, so to speak. But that's really all I got on Nessie this week. That's my, in my opinion, that's how Nessie came to be. Yeah. So, so, ah, oh, yeah. So this is like. As far as movies with sounds, the mm-hmm. two big movies from the 1930s I can think of are King Kong and Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. Like Frankenstein being 1931. So this was like the time of movies with sound. Sa- that it's all making sense now. Yep. I don't know when Nosferatu came out, but that didn't have any sound. Yeah. So like... This is one of the blockbuster movies, right? The iconic blockbuster movies of the 1930s. So, like, 
And it's the first kind of movie like this, really. Right? Um, it's the first that, like, imagines these things in a way that is realistic. And I, I say realistic, but I don't mean to us nowadays. I mean to them. Right? Because then, this was, like, the most advanced technology that had ever been used to depict dinosaurs and monsters and things along those lines, right? So, we're talking about a first-off thing, and it's just so wild to me that it was just, we just had this perfect environment for Nessie to come into existence, and then nobody really thought critically about it. Yeah, so just looking at the movie list, the the top 100 movies of the 1930s, Mm -hmm. um, the only monster movie on that list is, uh, there's only two, and that's Bride of Frankenstein and King Kong. All of the rest are um, just, like, I guess dramas, maybe, Um, and then Wizard of Oz. Like, that, and that's all of them. (laughs) And, like, King Kong is top 45 on that list, on one of the lists I'm looking at. And, like, yeah. that's really high for a monster movie. And it's also, like, the one of the first on the list in terms of, like, fame and, like, just big budgetness. And, like, also consider Bride of Frankenstein is not, like, it's not monster in the same way, too. No. Right? It's it's monster in that you have a few people with special effects on their face, but they're not like doing crazy wild special effects for this. It just is. So like, it, I don't know. I don't really have much else to say, Brandon. If you got something to say, go for it. But like, that's Nessie. Yeah, that that's yeah that's that's, it. that's Nessie. Nessie. That's Nessie. Uh we'll talk about what people have done with that myth. That, that story since then, but, like, that's Nessie to me. Yeah. Uh, and to me, that's almost actually more interesting than if there was an actual, uh, an actual plesiosaur in Loch Ness. But I'm also a weirdo who just likes, like, urban legends and the way people view society and things like that, so... Uh, that the the way that things manifest in society is frequently more interesting than if there was an unknown lizard somewhere. Yeah, because like it, it's you're talking about like the progression of humanity and like why we have these like myths and legends. Um, and that's that's just that's just cool to me. Oh yeah. Um, otherwise I wouldn't have made, I wouldn't have, we wouldn't have made this podcast if it wasn't. So, <laughs> um, as always, our website is com. Our Instagram is at cryptopediacast. Our Twitter is at cryptopediacast. Email us at cryptopediacast at gmail.com or us at cryptopediacast.com. We have a Patreon and Brandon, will you thank our jackalopes this week? Yes. Thank you to Clay Sinclair, Marty Von Party, Bird Schneider, Jonathan Shepard, and Matthew Smith. So we have a Facebook group. Um, I don't. I haven't looked at it in a while. I'm sorry. Um, if you enjoy the podcast, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, share it with your friends, all that kind of stuff. You know, people you think might like it. People you hate. Um, you know, the, the usuals. Uh, and if you have any monster requests or stories, you can send them in because we are now officially at the point where I've finished all of them. There's go making our way through the list. Oh, also um, there's a Discord. Um, oh yeah, the Discord's important. That, yeah, that's join that. that, that that's where something. we uh, we uh, interact and uh, chat and play the video games with people and such. I, I will say that um, the general is called generally cursed. Uh, we've had a lot of people join the Discord and then instantly leave the Discord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it it's actually kind of hilarious at that this point, like. We don't know what you're expecting, but it's probably not what, based on the number of people that leave immediately. <laughs> yeah, it, it's pretty startling. Um, it's weird in there, but like I also say, things are gonna get weird at the end of every episode. So like, if you go, if you go to our Discord and 
don't think it's going to be weird, like, you're just not listening to the end of the episodes. Yeah, that's where the, f- that's where the weirdness gets, is in the yeah, Discord. That's where the- and also the Pornhub sounds. You know, we're at an episode 98. You'd think we'd get this down. Yeah, you can find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is voyeurb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at cryptobrandon. On Instagram, I'm at sleepyboy69. It's, it's the end of the episode, so I'm, I'm yawning. Um, my Instagram is at mu2057. My Twitter is at jfdunham. My website is johndunhamgames.com, and my email is john at cryptopediacast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You can find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatercloryco.com, and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. And before I sign off, I just want to point out, this is episode 98, Brandon. Yeah, it's, that's a thing. We're two episodes away from episode 100. What the fuck happened? I don't know. For the last 50 episodes, every time I record an episode, I'm still like, how is this still a thing? (laughs) Pretty much, pretty much, pretty much. It's a miracle. It's a miracle it lasts this long. Uh It's a miracle. It's also like, there's, I'm finding more. We did this because we're like, there's cool cryptids and creatures and we like that kind of thing. And I've since discovered more than I ever thought there was and have a uh, word document with so many more that I also didn't know were things. I just keep losing faith in humanity is what happens to me. That's fair. Yeah. Um, But anyways, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weird. (laughs) 